Hello everyone uh, and welcome back. We are going to talk about uh, uh, groundwater flow in today's lesson. But before we uh, get on with groundwater flow, let us look at the question set of the previous lesson. The first question that I gave you last time around was uh, among the following saturated deposits, which one has the greatest potential as an aquifer? Uh, the three deposits are glacial outwash, alluvial fan and floodplain silt. Now, if you recall from our previous lesson, what I said was that the in order to in order uh, for the uh, geologic unit to qualify as an aquifer, we need to have uh, a fairly coarse uh, grain size distribution uh, grain size structure of the uh, of the geologic unit, and as a result, what we are going to get is uh, we are going to prefer. Uh, a, we are not going to prefer floodplain silt because that is going to have a relatively uh, small permeability. Uh, in, it, is, it is not going to uh, conduct uh, groundwater quite that easily. So, we are left with the other two alternatives. Now, the uh, glacial outwash and the alluvial fan among these two, uh, alluvial fan is heterogeneous it is going to have distribution of grain size grain sizes over a very wide uh, range it is going to have gravel size particles to silt size particles and there might be in fact lenses of uh, lenses of silts within the mass of alluvial fan which is going to impede drainage in the long run so we are going to end up we are going to end up with uh, selecting the first option in this case uh, that is glacial outwash. In this case, we are going to have uh, fairly coarse grain size distribution and uh, uh, that is going to make it suitable as a groundwater. Uh, it is going to qualify the uh, deposit as a good source of groundwater or it is going to act as a good uh, groundwater aquifer. Now, the second question that I asked, uh, asked was uh, can a reservoir of conate water be tapped as a long term groundwater source? Now, conate water uh, is typically entrapped within isolated uh, cavities within the formation of, uh, of rock. Uh, as a result, what happens? The supply of conate water is relatively limited. So, if you start tapping conate water, it is not going to last over a very long uh, time uh, before depletion and because of the fact that the uh, that the pore space within which the water is stored conate water is stored is isolated it doesn't really have much option of getting recharged uh, during wet seasons so conate water therefore does not qualify uh, as a groundwater source to be used over a relatively longer duration. The third question that I asked was, uh, was uh, describe, uh, in fact I asked you to describe the interdependence between porosity and permeability. Now, what was apparent from the previous day's discussion was that uh, if you have got a formation, subsurface formation which has got large porosity that is likely to have large permeability as well. But what you need to also consider is that what you need is a distribution of pore space, inter you need to have a large proportion of pore space which is relatively, uh, relatively interconnected, which is interconnected and not only that, the interconnected void space should have a larger opening size. In other words, if you have got a fine grain matrix, then the capillaries that are going to form by interconnected void space are going to be very small diameter indeed. As a result, the water that would like to flow through the tubes are going to resist the movement is because of, uh, primarily because of capillary action uh, of the capillary action. Uh, because of surface tension of water. So, what we need 
is a larger porosity matrix, but that is not the only fact that you need to uh, that you need to look at while selecting a potential groundwater aquifer. You also need to look at what is the grain size distribution of the uh, of the formation as well. In addition to it, you need to ensure that the pore spaces uh, are relatively interconnected. Okay, so that takes care of the question set of the previous lesson. Now uh, we move on with today's subject matter. What we want to learn in this particular lesson, we would like to be able to at this at the end of this lesson, we would like to be able to list the objectives and procedures for groundwater investigation. We would like to be able to list the factors that influence groundwater flow through soil and rock, estimate permeability for simple subsurface conditions from laboratory and field tests and finally, we would like to be able to estimate uh, for very simple uh, subsurface condition what is the volume of groundwater flow that is likely to take place. Okay. So, first of all we look at the typical procedures and uh, objectives and procedures for groundwater investigation. Now, in order to assess groundwater potential, the first step is to carry out a groundwater investigation. That investigation should ideally give us some idea about the safe yield of an aquifer. So, in order to do that, we, are, we not only need uh, investigation of the groundwater condition, subsurface groundwater condition, we also need to have some handle on the meteorological aspects or weather pattern, uh, some idea about the weather pattern uh, or that is prevalent in the particular region of interest. Then the second purpose is to identify groundwater related engineering problems. We are, we are going to look at uh, some time later some of these uh, problems. Uh, uh, some of the some of the groundwater related problems that are handled by uh, engineering that often needs to be handled by engineering geologists and then we need to identify also the groundwater chemistry in some problems in other words whether the groundwater is going to be suitable for a particular use such as use as uh, drinking water or use as irrigation water or any such uh, uh, or, or for that matter use as construction water supply. Okay, so, we need to identify the potentially harmful chemical constituents in ground waters, uh, ground water sources depending on the use of the ground water source. Then that actually gives us a list of parameters that might be of our interest and these parameters we would like to get from groundwater investigation. First of all, we need to be able to assess the groundwater table contour or the artesian pressure depending on whether we are looking at a confined aquifer or, an, or rather unconfined aquifer and a confined aquifer. Secondly, we would like to be able to estimate what is the natural recharge and discharge affecting a groundwater source. And thirdly, we would like to get an estimate of the permeability of the underground geological formation that is used as groundwater source. Continuing with groundwater investigation. Uh, the procedure, one of the procedures in is uh, it involves groundwater prospecting. So, why what we need to do, what we attempt to do in groundwater prospecting is to identify a source of groundwater. Typically, uh, resistivity survey is a very common procedure for undertaking, uh, for, for identifying a potential source of groundwater or, poten or, or uh, a zone. 
of saturated soil underneath the ground surface. We have looked at the uh, main uh, features or essential details of resistivity survey in one of our earlier lessons on uh, subsurface exploration. So, I am not going to get uh, once again into the detail of this particular procedure. Then another type of investigation that is carried out is called groundwater survey and that involves installation of monitoring wells, drawing water samples for assessing groundwater chemistry from the monitoring wells and long term monitoring of the monitoring well to assess seasonal fluctuations in groundwater level within these wells or artesian pressures within these wells. Now, what is also done in addition to all these things for groundwater survey is to pump out the wells at steady state in order to assess what is the potential yield from this particular uh, well and that is called well testing. So, all these steps are carried out in groundwater survey and groundwater prospecting. So, then you might ask uh, what is a monitoring well which is used in groundwater, monitor, uh, groundwater survey. A typical cross section of a monitoring well is shown on this particular uh, sketch. So, it is essentially a casing, a tube, casing tube installed within a pre-board uh, hole in the uh, ins inserted within a pre-board uh, hole drilled or uh, bored or excavated within the ground and the casing is shown at the center of the hole there and you can see that there is a backfill around the casing. Let us go from the top at the top end of the casing you can see a cap and you can see that there are two vents on the left side of this particular sketch and these vents are provided in order to give vent to any gases that might be present in groundwater. And then the well casing is protected by installing a protective cover. This is usually a lockable protective cover uh, encased within a concrete uh, backfill at the top. So, this one here, this one here is a concrete encasement in order to hold the protective casing and then underneath the uh, protective under, underneath the concrete within the annular space in between the casing tube and the borehole wall is a semi, -pervi semi pervious backfill. Uh, typically, you can use uh, silty clay or clay silt uh, or glacial till or that kind of uh, material which is uh, not totally uh, permeable. And underneath the backfill there is a seal. This particular seal is constructed using very fine grained material such as bentonite in order to seal the uh, portion of the casing tube that actually is used in extracting groundwater, uh, which is in turn encased within a filter pack. Filter pack is essentially a uniform, uh, uniform sized filter sand and you can see that encased within, a fil within the filter pack is a perforated segment of the casing tube and through the perforations the groundwater enters the tube and the portion of groundwater that is that enters the tube is used in groundwater monitoring or uh, testing of the aquifer. Now, you can also see uh, 
at the bottom of the perforated section there is a trap or the solid uh, portion of the casing tube extends a little bit below the perforated segment of the casing tube and this particular portion is, uh, is normally installed in order to ensure if there is any fine grain debris that move into the casing tube with groundwater entering the casing tube through perforations get trapped at the bottom of the casing tube uh, without clogging the pipe casing tube itself. Okay. What you see here is that there is a Vedo zone or unsaturated partially saturated zone near the surface. So, ground surface in this case is here underneath the ground surface is a partially saturated Vedo zone underneath the Vedo zone is a saturated zone and on uh, the interface between the saturated and unsaturated zone as we know uh, from previous lesson is the uh, entity called the water table. What, you, what we also have sh shown here is that the casing tube in this particular case penetrates the entire depth of the saturated zone and it is encased within an underlying uh, underlying aquiclude near the bottom of the tube there. Okay, so, that in a nutshell is a very sim simply constructed uh, monitoring well that is used that that is normally used in groundwater survey. Okay. So, then we would like to know what are the causes or what are the driving factors that trigger groundwater flow. First of all, flow is caused by head loss and length of flow, uh, flow is caused by the ratio of head loss to the length of the flow path and this particular term is called the hydraulic gradient. Simply stated what is meant here is that if you have if you have got a ground if you have got the water table existing at a higher elevation at some location within within the general geographic region that you are interested in to uh, 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 at in comparison with another location within the area where the groundwater table is at a lower elevation then what we are going to see there is that usually the water groundwater is going to move from the water, from the location where water table is at a higher elevation to the location where water table is at a lower elevation and that is because water is going to flow we have already we have already stated that in previous lesson is that groundwater is that portion of soil moisture which is free flowing or which is which which can move which can be mobilized by the action of gravity. So, uh, it is going to move from a location where it has got a higher potential energy to a location where it has got a lower potential energy and the elevation of water table is a measure of the potential energy of an unconfined aquifer. So, in that situation water is going to move from a location where water table is at a greater elevation to a location where water table is at a lower elevation. Then the second thing that actually that actually triggers groundwater flow is groundwater flow is directed from a location of higher pressure to a location where the pressure is comparatively smaller. Okay. So, this one here is uh, applicable in case of both artesian uh, groundwater flow as well as non artesian or water table type uh, groundwater flow. Let us look at uh, the details. Let us say 
we have got a section where we have got a mountain stream that is running we are we are showing a cross section here actually we have got a mountain stream that is towards the right of this particular sketch and we have got another stream running parallel to the previous one but at a lower elevation towards the left of this particular sketch okay so the location of the water table this is a situation involving a an unconfined aquifer so here the location of the water table is shown by the thick uh, cyan line uh, at near the top of this particular sketch so here what we are going to expect is that because of the fact that the elevation of the water table is much higher towards the right of this particular sketch the flow here is going to take place from the right to the left okay so what is the what is the definition of hydro let's look at what is uh, meant by hydraulic gradient using this particular configuration here so here the flow length is going to be l shown by the orange arrow there along the water table and the head loss in this particular case is going to be h indicated towards the left of this sketch so the hydraulic gradient that is going to trigger the flow of groundwater from the right side of this sketch to the left side of this sketch is going to be h over l and that is the hydraulic gradient under which the flow is going to take place in this particular case <coughs> okay let's look at the flow uh, in case of in case of an uh, artesian groundwater condition which is shown on the sketch of this particular slide here now here again the flow is going to be caused by head loss divided by the length of the flow path but in this case the head loss is going to be slightly different uh, and that is going to be given by these quantities actually it is uh, it is going to be given by uh, the difference in elevation between the recharge area and the elevation of the outlet of the artesian well so in this case the head loss is going to be this one and the length of the flow path in this particular case is going to be this much so hydraulic gradient is normally expressed using the symbol i so i in this case is going to be equal to h over l now here also the flow is going to take place uh, between the recharge zone which is towards the top left of this particular sketch towards the artesian well and this is the the outflow direction is shown by the thick arrow within the uh, with near the outlet of the artesian well in the sketch okay so h and l are explained already now we need to look at so we have already looked at what are what is the driving mechanism of groundwater flow so groundwater flow is driven by the uh, by the hydraulic gradient essentially so what is hydraulic gradient hydraulic gradient is the ratio of the head loss between the inlet and the outlet divided by the length of the flow path that is hydraulic gradient so that is going to drive the groundwater flow now what is now the question comes what are the factors that are going to inhibit or uh, going to discourage the movement of groundwater flow we know some of these concepts already from the previous uh, lesson uh, 
So, inhibitors of groundwater flow include first of all capillary tension. So, we need to have la relatively large void space in order to get a reasonably good groundwater flow as we have already discussed. Second inhibitor of groundwater flow is uh, that is when you have got highly bent uh, interconnect highly bent interconnected uh, pore spaces. If you have got relatively straight flow path or the interconnected pore spaces are relatively straight then the flow through the soil uh, flow of groundwater through the soil is going to be relatively easy. So, tortuosity is another inhibitor, tortuosity is a measure of how bent are individual flow paths shown by yellow arrows there uh, in comparison with straight flow paths. So, tortuosity is another inhibitor of groundwater flow and the third inhibitor of groundwater flow is fluid viscosity. So, if you have got less viscous uh, pore fluid that is going to flow through the interstitial void space interconnected interstitial void space within the subsurface formation relatively easily in comparison with another fluid that has got a much larger viscosity. Okay. So, these are the factors that inhibit groundwater movement. Now, we need to formalize the concept a little bit. Uh, Darcy's law is the law that governs groundwater flow and what it states really is that apparent velocity V is proportional to the hydraulic gradient. In other words, V is equal to a constant of proportionality times the hydraulic gradient and this particular constant of proportionality is called the coefficient of permeability or hydraulic conductivity uh, and that is in fact a measure of the factors that inhibit groundwater flow through a subsurface formation. Now, you need to what we need to uh, what we need to stress here is that V the quantity V is not the actual velocity rather than rather it is the apparent velocity and apparent velocity is actually defined as the volume of water flowing through a unit cross sectional area of the aquifer uh, and that is going to be different from the actual velocity. Why that is going to be different? is because the amount of length or the length of the route traveled by ground water through the aquifer is going to be different from the straight line distance from the inlet to the outlet within the aquifer because of the tortuosity of the interconnected void space. So, the velocity apparent velocity is typically much small is going to be much smaller than the actual velocity with which the groundwater is going to travel through the interstitial void space within the subsurface formation. You need to really uh, understand the difference between apparent velocity and the actual velocity of groundwater flow in this respect. All right. <clears throat> factors affecting permeability we know some of these things already because what I have indicated in the previous slide is that the uh, constant of proportionality or the coefficient of permeability or hydraulic conductivity we are going to we are going to use the term permeability in this this particular lesson but you need to understand that the coefficient of the, the concept is in uh, the, the term is in fact interchangeable with hydraulic conductivity. Uh, now, first of all we mentioned in the previous lesson is that permeability is a measure 
of those factors that inhibit groundwater flow. We know that already from what we have uh, learned so far. Now, so what, is, what are the factors that inhibit groundwater flow? Those, those same factors are also going to be respons also going to be affecting permeability uh, in the in 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 the uh, in the long run. So, what are those factors? First of all, grain size is an important factor. We have already seen that if you have got uniformly graded subsurface formation, then you are going to have a relatively easy groundwater movement through the formation. So, the permeability is going to be relatively high. If you have got fine grained soils, if you have got fine grained soils, so here actually I need to make a correction. In fact, uniformly graded soil will have large larger permeability and if you have got a fine grained soils on the other hand the the void space are going to be very fine so the water is going to be uh, held it's 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 going to, the movement of the water within the interstitial pore space is going to be uh, inhibited by the capillary tension. So, that in fact is going to lead to a smaller permeability. Second aspect is void ratio. If you have got a much tighter packing or small void ratio, then you are going to have a lower permeability. If you have got viscosity or uh, if you have got a highly viscous pore fluid, then you are going to have a smaller permeability. So, you need to make you need to note the correction as far as uh, grain size is concerned which I have already uh, noted at the top there. So, if you have got uniformly graded uh, subsurface formation that is going to have a larger permeability not lower permeability as indicated on this particular slide here. So, you need to take a note of that one. Uh, so, in order to to summarize all these things that we mentioned, permeability k is going to be proportional to a representative to the square in fact of the representative grain size or the surface um, or, or the surface area of the particles. So, if you have got a very large surface area, you are going to have a uh, you are going to have a smaller permeability, then permeability k is going to be proportional to the unit weight of the pore fluid divided by the viscosity of the pore fluid and permeability k is also proportional to a term a term equal to E cube divided by 1 plus E where E is the void ratio. So, all these all these uh, factors are going to affect permeability. It is going to depend on the de representative value of the grain size. It is going to depend on the specific surface or S. Uh, it is going to be proportional to the specific surface in fact and proportional to the square of the representative value of the grain size it is going to be proportional to gamma w over mu w and it is going to be proportional to E cube over 1 plus E. So, these are all experimentally uh, observed uh, parameters that affect that are known to affect permeability. Okay. So, some, some more factors that affect permeability saturation ratio is another factor that is going to affect permeability and in fact permeability decreases remarkably as the formation loses saturation is because the pore space become occupied by uh, non interconnected uh, volumes of water 
and these non interconnected volumes of water are relatively difficult to mobilize through the interstitial void space. As a result, saturation goes down drastically as the formation becomes partially saturated from in, in comparison with a completely saturated formation of identical characteristics. Then second aspect you need to consider are the existence of imperfections such as bedding planes, fractures and joint sets. Cross bedding permeability is usually smaller by order of by almost an order of magnitude in many cases and fractures and joint sets they are since they are more permeable in comparison with the rock that is in between uh, in between the fracture or joint sets as and this also affects the uh, distribution of permeability and the cross anisotropic or anisotropic or in other words actually this leads both these aspects they lead to the development of cross anisotropy in permeability properties. Uh, not cross anisotropy actually anisotropic uh, permeability behavior. So, anisotropy. anisotropic K. So, both these aspects lead to anisotropic K. In other words, K is going to be different along the fracture sets rather than in comparison with the value of K in, in a direction which is perpendicular to the fracture sets. And same is true in case of bedding planes. Okay. You also need to consider time dependent changes in permeability. Permeability although we, we uh, in Darcy's law uh, permeability was treated as a constant if you recall V or the apparent velocity is given by permeability times the hydraulic gradient and we consider in that particular case K is a constant, but in fact K might actually change with time. Uh, Deep, uh, because of several different reasons because of mechanical reasons or because of chemical reasons as we are going to see in the next little bit. What could happen actually with time uh, uh, over which the groundwater flows through a particular aquifer? Clogging may take place or opening of pore spaces may take place. These are two opposite effects. If the pore spaces get clogged because of migration of solids or because of chemical precipitation, then the, uh, the permeability of that particular formation is going to decrease as the time passes. On the other hand, if the pore space becomes larger, uh, then the permeability is going to increase as the time passes. And this also can happen by in case of hydrofracturing. Uh, we looked at some of uh, we looked at very uh, uh, br brief we looked at the details of hydrofracturing very briefly uh, some time back in one of the earlier lessons uh, regarding in situ stress of uh, within a subsurface formation okay so if you have got if you get hydrofracturing triggered within a formation then permeability is going to increase for that particular formation. Second thing is changes in void ratio. Void ratio in fact might change as time passes and that is particularly true in case of fine grained soils. In case of fine grained soils uh, depending on pore water movement uh, the, the stress may increase in, in situ uh, total stress might increase and as soon as that stress increases initially the stress tra get transferred to the pore water and because of the increase of pore water uh, there is a there there could be a sub there could be a decrease in sigma v prime initially uh, 
or the effective stress might decrease and this particular process ends up in draining of the interstitial pore water from the matrix of fine grained soils and that process leads to the reduction of void ratio and finally, the incremental increment initial increment of the total stress get transferred to the uh, to the uh, interparticulate contact stress or the effective stress and the initial increment of the pore water pressure goes down to 0. And this particular process because of the fact that it leads to a decrease of void ratio this process is going to lead also to a substantial reduction in the permeability of the stratum. Third thing that you need to consider in order to uh, in order to account for time dependent changes in permeability is rise and fall of water table. When the water table rises the amount of Vedo zone or the thickness of Vedo zone is going to decrease as a result the uh, lateral the flow in the lateral direction is going to likely to increase as the water table rises and opposite is the case when the water table lower water table uh, settles to a small lower elevation uh, after the uh, after the wet season is over. Fourth point is changes uh, changes in proportion of dissolved gases in pore water that also might actually lead to a time dependent change in permeability because dissolved gases tend to alter the viscosity property of the pore fluid as a result permeability changes depending on the amount of dissolved gases in pore water. Okay. So, these are essentially the set of factors that affect permeability and now we look at the typical values of permeability of different types of uh, aquifers and we are going to look at different types of soils and different types of rocks, typical values of permeability of different types of rocks and soils and how permeability uh, depends on the geomorphologic character or, geo or geomorphology of a particular deposit. So, we look at we, we look at all those things from this particular table here. It is obvious that you have, if you have got clean gravel the permeability is going to be much larger in comparison with an intact clay deposit. Clean gravels have got permeability in excess of 1 centimeter per second whereas, intact clay might have permeability as low as 10 to the power minus 9 centimeter per second. So, outwash deposits are towards the left end of this particular permeability scale. Then we might have channel sand, kame moraine and eskers. Kame moraine and eskers are two different types of glaciofluvial deposits if you recall from our previous lessons. Uh, channel sand, kame moraine and eskers have got typically permeability in between 1 centimeter per second to 10 to the power minus 3 centimeter per second. Glacial tills, valved clay are even uh, are of even smaller permeability range in between 10 to the power minus 3 to 10 to the power minus 7 and massive lacustrine clay are on the lowest scale or on the they are the most impermeable of all these different geologic units that we looked at here and they have got permeability between 10 to the power minus 7 and 10 to the power minus or, or smaller than 10 to the power minus 7. Consider some rocks. If you have got highly fractured rock then the, you are going to have permeability uh, of 1 centimeter per second or more. Sandstone and siltstones typically have got permeability of 10 to the power minus 1 centimeter per second uh, 
to about 10 to the power minus 5 centimeter per second. Fresh sandstone, siltstone, well compacted uh, fresh sandstone and siltstone, they have got permeability on the order of 10 to the power minus 6 centimeter per second, whereas limestone and granite, they are the most impermeable of all. Uh, we, are, we are talking about compact limestone in this particular case, fresh, compact, unjointed limestone. They might have permeability on the order of 10 to the power minus 8 centimeter per second. Then at the bottom row there, we indicate what qualifies a particular geologic unit as a good aquifer, aquitard or aquiclude. Now, good aquifer is if you have got a permeability greater than 10 to the power minus 3 centimeter per second typically. So, clean sand, sand gravel mixtures, some sandstone, siltstone, highly fractured rock, channel sand, commemorane, eskers and outwash deposits typically are within this category. Aquitards comprised typically of clay silt, sandy silt uh, from the consideration of geomorphology, glacial tills and warped clay often form this often uh, are classified as aquitards. <coughs> On the other hand, if you have got if you have got intact clay, massive or lacustrine clay, fresh limestone and granite, then those geologic units are not likely to conduct any groundwater movement at all uh, for any practical purpose. So, they qualify as aquicludes. Just have a look at these, uh, these uh, values because there is a lot of information uh, presented on this particular slide before we move on to the next uh, topic. Okay. <clears throat> the question comes how we are going to determine permeability. So, there could be laboratory methods or there could be uh, field methods uh, that might be used in order to determine permeability. So, two simple method, two simple laboratory methods are first taken up. Uh, I am going to describe uh, them uh, to begin with and then I am going to describe one simple field method for determination of permeability. The first method that we look at is uh, shown schematically on this particular uh, slide. Uh, it is called constant head laboratory permeability test. So, what is done here is that a soil or rock sample is placed under constant head difference. So, at the bottom end of the cylindrical sample, you have got a lower head elevation, lower uh, groundwater pressure corresponding to the tail water elevation. So, this one here is the tail water elevation and at the other end of the of the sample, we have got a much larger, much higher elevation. And the difference between these elevations are going to run, going to trigger groundwater flow and the difference is in fact H. So, in this particular case, the permeability is simply given by the flow that takes place through the specimen in meter cube per second multiplied by the length of the specimen over the head loss multiplied by the cross sectional area of the specimen. So, H multiplied by A is in the denominator uh, 
of this particular expression. So, Q is in the unit of volume per second, L is in length unit, H is in length unit and A is in the units of square of length. So, what you end up with is permeability K is going to be in the unit of 1 over length. Another method involves variable head test. In this particular case, what we do is we again use a cylindrical sample of uh, soil or rock and we allow a flow to take place under variable head through the specimen and we note the time for water level to drop from H naught to H 1 uh, as will be shown in the next uh, animation and from these two measurements we get permeability using the equation shown at the bottom left of this particular slide. Now, let us look at the animation of the experimental procedure. So, first of all we place the cylindrical specimen uh, under at that, that particular configuration shown on the right and then we let the water table to drop to a smaller elevation. We find the time difference between these two elevations between between the time difference between when the water within the stand pipe at the top end of the cylinder was at H naught and that at uh, the height of water of H 1 and from these data we can calculate the permeability using the expression which is given on the le bottom left of this particular slide. Now, laboratory methods are not representative of the uh, laboratory methods are not representative uh, in many cases of the uh, general uh, nature of a large mass of aquifer that might have to be encountered in the field. So, many engineering geologists prefer in fact field variable head test as opposed to a laboratory uh, test. Uh, now, a field variable head test is conducted within a monitoring well and what is done in this particular case is say you have got a monitoring well like this and the water table location is as shown on the left of this particular uh, slide here. So, water table is as shown here. So, here what you are going to what we are going to first do is to bail out the water from within the stand within the casing tube so that the elevation of the water level within the tube goes down to a depth of H naught below the existing water table. And then the water table is allowed to rise to another depth H 1 H 1 and what we do in this case we find out the time difference between when the water table was at H naught depth below the existing water table uh, or the water within the casing tube was at a depth of H naught uh, from the water table and that when uh, water is at a depth of H 1 below the existing water table and from these two measurements we can compute the permeability using the expression on the right of this particular slide. Now, this test, this particular equation represents uh, an aquifer which is unconfined and extends to a great depth below the water table. Now, we, I want, I want to give you an example of uh, flow of groundwater and this you can uh, in in which there is a road cut and there is an aquifer unconfined aquifer within sandstone that actually discharges uh, water into the road cut and there is an interceptor drain uh, parallel to the road cut as shown on this particular sketch. What you should try to uh, find from this particular configuration, you should try to find the amount of water uh, 
that is going to flow into the drain or in other words how much of flow that the interceptor drain needs to be designed for. Now you try to uh, answer this particular question in your, uh, in, your, uh, in your leisure time and we are going to look at this uh, answer, we are going to look at this calculation when we meet uh, with the next uh, presentation uh, next time around. So until then bye for now, thank you very much. Hello everyone and uh, welcome back. We are going to continue our discussion on uh, groundwater flow in this lesson as well uh, and uh, we are going to begin with the example or the question or the problem that I asked uh, near the end of the last uh, lesson. Uh, we are going to try to find out the solution for this one. Now this was the problem here. Uh, that we have got a uh, road cut basically uh, which intercepts an unconfined aquifer within a sandstone uh, bed within sandstone bedrock uh, the underlying intact granite is uh, relatively impervious so the question that i asked was uh, how much of flow uh, uh, will be intercepted on the drain that uh, runs along parallelly along the uh, left edge of the highway uh, shown on the cross section in the sketch there and the uh, the problem was uh, the statement of the problem was like this uh, the the uh, permeability of the sandstone aquifer was uh, 10 to the minus 4 centimeter per second uh, and the the what I asked was uh, for you to find the design discharge for the interceptor drain. Okay, now let's get on with the solution first. Uh, in this particular configuration, what we have is uh, the hydraulic gradient is equal to the amount of head loss over the length of flow, and this particular thing will be same in this case as the slope of the top of the water table uh, so it is in this particular case it is going to be uh, one fourth what we also have is the permeability is equal to 10 to the power minus 4 centimeter per second uh, that is in turn going to be equal to 10 to the power minus 6 meter per second. Uh, I should actually draw your attention to my uh, usage of uh, centimeter per second as the, as the unit of permeability although we are in general sticking to uh, SI units in this particular uh, in, in this particular series of lessons.